Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Talking Tim. My name is Nilu Parvinashtiani and I'll be helping with facilitating today's webinar. This webinar is sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration and hosted by the National Operations Center of Excellence or NOCO. Uh, so just a quick reminder, if you don't know us already, um, we support the Transportation System Management and Operations community by providing resources to them. So in, on your screen right now, on the bottom left side, you see a pod called Useful Links, uh, where you can click through there to uh, visit uh, our website and other resources for TISMO news and announcements. Uh, also, you can access previous uh, webinar recordings for this series and other NOCO webinars and case studies uh, from those links. Um, now I'll cover just a few logistics for the webinar today. Uh, we are recording the webinar and that recording along with the um, PDF of the presentation slides for all the presenters today will be available through the on-demand learning section of NOCO website. Uh, all the attendee forms are on listen-only mode by default, but uh, please stay engaged during the webinar by using the question discussion pod for any comments and questions. So uh, just put your questions uh, at that pod as they come to your mind during the presentations. And we have dedicated some time at the end to uh, do Q&A, um, um, and each of your questions will be read by the moderator and will be answered by our presenters. So that's all I had, um, and with that, I'll hand it over to our moderator for today, uh, Paul Jordan. Paul, take it away. Thank you, Nilo, and thank you, uh, Nilo, and thank you for uh, the National Center of Excellence again for uh, for uh, hosting us. Um, so, we um, we uh, greetings to everybody, and um, we're excited to have so many people joining us again. Um, we uh, hope everyone is is safe and uh, wearing their mask in public and social distancing. And um, we are here at Federal Highway because we're all working from home, as I'm sure most of you are as well. So um, we hope to have a nice, exciting agenda for you today. Hopefully we give you some good information. And um, we, today we're, uh, we're going to have our usual introduction by me, quick few minutes, and then uh, Jim Ostrich is going to do his usual intro to the um, – to the, you know, not intro, I mean um, update on the National Tim Responder Training and anything else that he has in mind. And um, and uh, then we'll move on to um, uh, meet the National Tim Executive Leadership Group. We're going to have this segment every month now. Uh, you know, we've been meeting for uh, several years. Uh, Jim, I forget how long, maybe 2014 or 15. <laughs> The yeah. executive leadership group was um, was organized after a a, the nat a national um, senior executive meeting was recommended, and we've had that we meet twice a year in person and twice uh, by a conference call. And uh, there's some really cool people, and uh, from all the responder disciplines, and then some, then uh, some disciplines that support the um, the leadership group. So uh, the first uh, the first would be um, today is the um, the Towing and Recovery Association. They're they're our first up, and uh, first and foremost in our minds is towers often get uh, killed at the rest of us. Um, I'm very excited to have uh, three people from Massachusetts today, and uh, Cindy Matno is uh, is one of those people. She's the executive director of the Towing and Recovery Association, along with the um, the, the president, uh, Joanne Blyton, is the elected president of the Towing Recovery Association. Uh, that um, is a great partner. Both are great partners with us. And uh, Cindy and I go way back as partners when she was active with the uh, Massachusetts uh, Tim, uh, Tim committee that we had, statewide Tim committee. So with that, um, I'll just uh, – oh, and then after that, excuse me, I'm sorry. And after that, the uh, DBRPC, um, actually, I have these out of order because I did them myself and uh, we can't trust me. But uh, Chris, Chris King has been a partner for a long time from DBRPC, and they have a great, a great TIM program that a lot of people are not, um, not aware of um, with multiple 
TIM committees being facilitated by, by DBIPC. Uh, Georgia has been had a, had a recent success story with the, uh, a, a, a TIM a virtual four-hour TIM session in Georgia, and Kevin Smith is going to give us an update on that. And then um, from Massachusetts, uh, many of you know I'm from Massachusetts. I manage the TIM program, among other things, in Mass. And um, so it's great to see that someone is finally doing a good job there in Massachusetts getting the institutionalization of the TIM training and other things going. So uh, with Ed Genacakis doing a great job there. So with that, um, Cindy, am I handing it to you or Joanne? I think we decided Cindy will talk about the uh, TRAA. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Cindy. Yep, so I'm just waiting for my slides to pop up. Oh, we'll okay. <laughs> and thank you for that great introduction, Paul. I appreciate it. All right. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this month's Talking Tim webinar and Meet the ELG. Today we have Joanne Blyton, president of, the, of TRAA with us. She'll be speaking in just shortly. I'm Cynthia Martineau, Executive Director of TRAA, and we'll get us started. The Towing and Recovery Association of America is the national towing association and voice of America's towing industry. TRAA was formed in 1979 and has been representing the interests of the nation's towing community for over 40 years. We represent the industry in legislation, education, and communication. In conjunction with our federal lobbying team, TREA is involved in regional and federal legislation and meeting with legislators to provide insight into our industry's issues and concerns. By educating the members of Congress, we can make a positive impact on pending and future legislation. It is our primary goal to provide safer roadways for the towing community and our incident management partners and the motoring public. Each year in March, TRA hosts the Towing Industry's Only Hill Day. The event is attended by TRA members and tow professionals from across the country. This year's focus was on responder safety, the need for federal move over law provisions, and data collection mandates. Despite COVID-19, <clears throat> we were able to meet with more than 25 members of Congress and their staffers to address key issues impacting the towing community. In addition, TRA looks for other resources to help our tow operators be safer out on the road. We recently hosted a webinar with Haas Alert to introduce the benefits of Safety Cloud, the industry's leading digital alerting and collision prevention service. We all have a responsibility to be proactive and take the steps necessary to protect all emergency responders. TRA just last week launched a new book on Amazon, How to Become a Tow Truck Operator, written by our Director of Education, Elizabeth Martineau Dupuy. In keeping with our commitment to, prom uh, to promoting and institutionalizing TIM, TIM training is listed as one of the qualifications needed to start a career in the towing industry. Despite the good work we've been doing as an emergency responder community, fatalities continue to occur. In response, TRAA, TRAA created the Killed in the Line of Duty Resource Guide for towing families who find themselves in the difficult situation of losing a loved one. There is so much more to do, and we must work diligently with our ELG partners to end the senseless loss of life. Now we'll hear from Joanne Blyton, TRA President. OK, I think I'm unmuted here. Uh, somebody tell me if I am, please. You're good to go. You're good, to go. good to go. Great. Uh, I want to start out by saying thank you to the ELG leadership for inviting us to participate here today and now moving on. TRAA has been pleased to represent the towing industry on the ELG since July of 2013, and we're still going strong. TRAA has benefited in many ways through our participation on the ELG. The building of relationships helps us all understand the importance of each responder's duties on the scene of a crash. Working together will help to reduce on-duty deaths as well as keep the highways open for travel. More recently, there is a widespread movement to mandate TIM training for tow operators, and we applaud that initiative. We continue to encourage our members and state tow associations to participate in TIM 
and long for the day that is a national requirement, not merely a recommendation. Focusing on traffic incident management practices does save time, saves lives, and saves money. As early as 2003, TRAA developed the TIMTO Guide to promote traffic incident management principles to the towing industry and updated our National Driver Certification Program study guide to include basic TIM protocols. TIM training is a prerequisite for our newest certification track, the Towing Recovery Support Certification Program designed for dispatchers and towing support staff. Our long-reaching goals align with Federal Highway to institutionalize TIM in all incident responder disciplines. The towing industry suffers the loss of one tow operator every six days. We in the towing industry are reminded of this every year as names are etched on the wall of the fallen at the International Towing Museum in Chattanooga, Tennessee. There's just too much loss from all of our disciplines. We have a lot of work to do as we forge ahead, setting our collective sights on the road to zero. Performance measures and good reporting systems like the voluntary Towing Traffic Incident Reporting System, TTIRS, and others are going to help us get there. TRAA continually speaks with members of Congress on the need for better move over law enforcement and consistency, safer roads and standardized data collection for all emergency responders. We thank the Emergency Responder Safety Institute for their tireless work on behalf of all responders through their educational materials and line of duty death data collection. More importantly, we thank Federal Highway for bringing us all together as one powerful Voice for Change, the Executive Leadership Group. We encourage all of you to reach out to TRAA if you need information or the name of a contact in your state or region. We will gladly connect you with the right person for the job. Here is the contact informa information for both Cynthia and me. And please visit our website for more information, resources, our TIM page, and links to members and state associations. In closing, I would like to say in the words of Martin Luther King, Jr., I have a dream, and so does TRAA, and that is zero name, inscribed on our wall in the fall. In, in the fall. And now I'm going to turn the webinar back over to Paul. Thank you, Joanne. Cindy, appreciate your partnership and uh, your presentation today. And, um, you know, just so that everyone knows that um, there's a, just about in every state, right, Joanne and Cindy, there's a, a statewide association, right? Is that accurate? Yes. Yep. So reach out to your association. But I know that most of you do um, already, but just for those of you that don't, they're important partners. So just a reminder, and if you have any trouble getting a hold of that association, there's our two people that will help us right there. And so with that, I, um, I, I might be subject to dismissal because I totally forgot to uh, have Jim go after me. And um, so, it, Nilo, if you could hey, just get Jim's slide up there and, yep. Paul, if you don't mind, I've lost uh, connection to the server. So why oh, don't I okay. go last, if that's okay with yeah. you and everybody? Yep, absolutely. absolutely. No worries. So, Thank you. Oh, see, I knew that. That's why I missed over. I skipped over. Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> So, yep. Okay. So with that, um, thank you again to TRAA. We have uh, Kevin, um, who is going to go next from uh, Georgia, who is going to give us a um, an update on how his Kevin Smith how how his um, virtual four hour session went. Most of us are familiar with the four hour sessions, and they're challenging enough in person. Never mind remote. So with that, Kevin, if you might, don't mind giving us uh, an update on how that worked. OK, can you hear me? Yes, sir, loud and clear. OK, good. Uh, my name is Kevin Smith. I'm retired law enforcement in Georgia. And I've been with, the, with Parsons Corporation, Emergency Transportation Operations Group, running the Georgia Time Task Force, which stands for Traffic Incident Management Enhancement. 
run through the Georgia Department of Transportation. Uh, as all of y'all know, the four-hour Sharp II class um, can be a challenge to put on and to get um, everybody there working together. Um, with uh, In Georgia, one of the ways that we promoted the Sharp II is first and foremost, Georgia Department of Public Health, uh, starting in 2018, made SHARP-2 a mandatory class, not only for initial licensing and certification of paramedics, but research. So anybody coming into the EMS field has to have SHARP-2, but also those who have been in the field had to have SHARP-2 to renew their paramedic license. Uh, in Georgia, that happens every two years. Also, the Georgia State Patrol signed on, and they are teaching it in their basic trooper schools. So each new trooper coming out gets sharp too. And another big win for us was with the Atlanta Fire Department rookie schools. The Atlanta Fire Department is one of the few agencies um, that I know of that is 100% sharp two certified. They spent about it took them about two to three years, but they went back through and did the sharp two training and got everybody that was on the job done, and all of their uh, probationary firefighters get sharp too now. Again, through the support of the Toll and Recovery Association of Georgia and the Toll and Recovery Association of America endorses this training, and the Toll and Recovery Incentive Program in Georgia, our TRIP program, it is required for any towing service that is going to participate in the program that all of their personnel be trip cert or I'm sorry, be Sharp Two certified. Um, and the uh, Georgia Association of Fire Chiefs require it for chief certification in Georgia. Like all of y'all, the pandemic interrupted the training schedule. We had multiple Sharp Two classes on typical on ground classes set out, but we had to find new ways to reach the res these responders because the responders still needed the training. One of the biggest benefits of the on-ground class, to me, is the interaction among the disciplines from the students there, from the different disciplines that attend the training. Um, one, to me, one of the drawbacks of the uh, NIH online class or the responder safety class is that you're just sitting in front of a terminal, in front of a computer terminal, watching a PowerPoint and then getting credit for it. What we wanted to do is we wanted to include that uh, classroom discussion in the uh, setting of the virtual environment. And we wanted to reach as many responders as possible. Uh, typically, a Sharp 2 class, many times that we do traditionally on ground, we might get 20 or 25 people that sign up for it, and some would make it and some wouldn't. Uh, the two virtual WebEx classes that we've taught we had 125 sign up for the first one, and we had 198 sign up for the second one. So we had really good, uh, really good sign up rates um, in the uh, virtual class since the students didn't have to leave and take half a day or a whole day to go somewhere. The classes will run through the Time Task Force website. We, um, we advertised the classes through the website and brought the uh, student into the website itself where they would come up and they could click onto uh, the calendar and it would take them straight into um, where the class was and then they could click on a class link and register for the class. Uh, there was two benefits. One, it, we, we were able to capture their information and so forth, but two, it brought them in to the Time Task Force website uh, and if they weren't familiar with it, uh, let them look around on the website to see what was going on and what other classes and training would be available. Uh, the class operations, we, we decided to use WebEx. Uh, you know, there's MS Teams, there's WebEx, there's Zoom, there's all kind of choices out there. But uh, our Parsons Corporation kind of dictated that we use the WebEx format. And just like our on-ground classes, we wanted to have uh, multiple instructors in the classroom. So we always had two instructors, uh, one law enforcement and one fire, or one fire and one tower, et cetera, so that we could have different viewpoints about the same incident. Everybody looks at a, a roadway incident a little bit differently, depending on your background and your discipline. 
just like the on ground class, we had breaks every hour. Um, and during the break, we would display up on the screen a 10-minute timer that would let the students know when we were going to be starting back. When we came back off of breaks, we had uh, several polling questions that were pushed out through the WebEx so that uh, we could see, A, if the student was actually paying attention to the lesson plan and, and getting the answers right on the polling questions. B, we could uh, ensure that the student is, the students are coming back from break in a timely manner. And C, it reinforces um, what the information is that we're trying to push out, that the questions are taken directly out of the lesson plan. The big part that we really enjoyed on it was the, the Q&A or the chat boxes. By using the chat box, we were able to keep the students engaged and the students could post um, uh, anecdotes about calls that they had gone on about the topic we were talking about. They could post questions about the specific topic we were talking about at the time and stay engaged with the class. I think any time you can engage the student and get the student talking about what's going on and what's going on in their jurisdiction and the specific problems they would deal with, the better off you are. Once the class was over, uh, at the end of the class, we directed uh, each student back to the Georgia Time Task Force website and to that specific class that we were teaching. And instead of a registration link, there was a test link posted in there. So once the class was over, the students had three hours, or I think it was three or four hours, where that link would be active. And they could go back there. They could take a 10-question test about the material. It was a um, typically in, in the classes that we teach on ground, we don't have a test at the end of it. We have the participation, and then the instructors keep monitoring the participation. But it was a compromise with Georgia Department of Public Health to ensure that the student actually was participating in the class and got the information that we actually had them take a written test to show that they had com comprehension of the material. Uh, another thing that we did that was a really important part of the class was the support personnel. We had uh, two other instructors, uh, sharp two instructors that were there monitoring the online environment and monitoring the discussion threads to ensure that questions were being asked, that technical issues would be addressed if someone wasn't able to hear and so forth. And as an instructor, it freed me up to be able to instruct the material and pay attention to what I was doing instead of trying to keep up with that discussion thread that was going on on the side. Anytime a, an important question came up that I wasn't addressing or if I missed something, the instructors who were monitoring the, the thread would unmute and step in and ask the questions for the students since in the, in the WebEx format, the students themselves couldn't actually unmute themselves. So that way we were able to make sure we kept the, the questions and um, the information flowing and kept the students engaged. Obviously, once the tests were completed, we had to go back in and I had to manually, I, I pulled the tests were created as a survey through constant contact and then the survey answers were, were recorded and I pulled all that into a spreadsheet so that I could quote unquote grade the test. And once the tests were graded, we created the certificates and mailed out, emailed the certificates to the students. Some of the major takeaways on the class, it is the virtual environment is a way where you can reach a lot more students than the on ground. And uh, even though we had 198 registered, you know, we only had maybe half of those actually take the class. But those that showed up stayed for the whole class. So we were able to, the class size itself, close to 100 students, is a much bigger uh, class for a four-hour class than we would normally get. It, we really focused on including that interdisciplinary discussion. And if you can't do on-ground classes, the virtual classroom is a, a decent way or a second best way to the in-person class to actually get the information out there and get your students engaged. Um, I don't know if there's any specific questions that anybody has about it, but uh, that's the uh, 
Kevin, there's a few, at least one question in the chat pod, but we'll we'll wait till the end for questions. I, I we usually do that to make sure that everyone uh, has has sufficient time. So um, okay, but, um, yeah, is this just like uh, this is this is just a, a a a brochure of the Parsons Emergency Transportation Operations Group that uh, we do. We have. Uh, ongoing projects in Hawaii, uh, California, Nevada, Utah, Virginia, uh, and so forth. We actually run the Virginia TRIP program, and we're expanding that nation, or, I'm sorry, statewide uh, later on this year. So if anybody would like any further information, please contact me. I appreciate y'all letting me speak. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I think Kevin put it, um, put it well when he, you know, and someone asked the question, can you still, can you, I think, can you still do that collaboration, um, you know, among among responders? Well, in, of course not. I mean, it's much more difficult. Um, I don't know if those challenges are, but maybe Kevin can either type his thoughts in um, or, um, or um, maybe we can talk about it after the, all the presentations are done. But, um, but yeah, it's still, it's, you know, the, Jim and I always say the highest and best use of the training is in person, right? That's where that's that's the highest in the multidisciplinary session set, uh, setting. Um, but the times that require adjustments, so that's what we're doing here. And I think Kevin, you did a great job, and um, and uh, kudos to the Georgia Time Program and all those folks in Georgia who has continuously for many years back. When I was back in Massachusetts, one of my best friends uh, along the corridor was uh, Gary Millsaps there and, and Georgia, and they had a great program then, and they continue on today. So um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you were part of it, and they continue to, to march forward with innovative thinking on how to get things done. So thanks, Kevin. So next up, I believe, is my good friend, Ed Ginokakis who is the um, emergency coordinator there in Massachusetts. He took over one of my responsibilities there in Mass. Uh, I had multiple hats that I wore in Mass. Uh, he took one of them, but now he knows how it feels because now Ed has multiple hats <laughs> that he's wearing in addition to the Tim uh, um, coordination efforts that he does. He has many other um, responsibilities as well, increasing every day <laughs> from what I understand. So. With that, now can we put um, Ed's presentation up? Hey, thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, uh, too many hats <laughs> at some point. Yeah. yeah, I get that. I get that. My father used to say, while we're waiting for the slides, my father used to say, if you want something done, give it to a busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew what he was talking about until uh, later in life. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. You know, we're... Uh, a lot of you know, just like most agencies, where you know we got uh, some of, some of our challenges and these new roles to fill, and uh, you know we're doing the best we can with what we got. So, yep. All right. So while we're waiting, uh, Paul, do you have anything else you wanted to add? No, nope, no. Nope. You take it from here, Ed. Thank you. All right. So once this presentation comes up, I'll just give you a, you know a brief uh, you know background. So uh, good afternoon. My name's Ed Jankoskis. I'm the coordinator of emergency preparedness for Mass. Highway Division. So I do a lot of the drills, the exercises, everything kind of emergency management related with the highway division specifically. Um, you know, like Paul used to do out at the, the State Emergency Operations Center in Framingham. I coordinate our, our DOT site out there through ESF-1. Um, oh, here we go. So I'm also the chairman of the Massachusetts Traffic Incident Management Task Force. I manage the Commonwealth Traffic Incident Management Program. And uh, today I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of our program and then kind of go into a little bit of detail of how we've institutionalized our program in the Commonwealth here, uh, and as well as a couple measures that we've taken to continue um, training through the COVID-19 pandemic, very similar to what uh, Kevin did um, in his presentation. All right. So again, just to give some background, our Traffic Incident Management Task Force provides a lot of input to the TIM training uh, from each relative uh, discipline. We have 13 different agencies and associations on our task force, from federal partners like Federal Highway to state, local, and uh, even some private representation with our statewide Tong Association. We enjoy a really good relationship with them, and they're very actively involved with a lot of the training we're doing. So we have a, we have a diverse group of disciplines that provide input to our program. 
from the medical examiner's office, you know, we've worked on some of their responses out there, to our Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Protection uh, the Massachusetts Highway Association, which includes a lot of local DPWs and uh, local highway departments. So basically, we capture any group that responds to an incident or event on our roadway uh, within the Commonwealth, and they have representation in a seat at the task force. All right. So in our quarterly meetings, we discuss a multitude of topics, including legis legislative items, uh, from strengthening our move over law to uh, hold harmless or steer it clear at initiatives to hands free uh, and others. So we've also focused on conducting after action reviews on major events, including planned events, and how TIM practices can support those planned events. Uh, we give a briefing of our TIM training status, as well as solicited input from the task force for changes, improvements, and training, as well as any recommendation for training locations or any kind of coordination contacts uh, who want training in those areas. So in coordination with our associated agencies, social media departments uh, for PSAs, uh, public information, you know, things like that. Uh, we also develop, uh, actually the task force is responsible for developing the Commonwealth Unified Response Manual, uh, which is a uh, document that lays out very basic, very high level, but roles and responsibilities for dealing with incident response in our roadways. Uh, and again, everybody on the task force has input on this, uh, and it's viewed as a best practice. So we get every agency to sign off on it, and, uh, you know, it, it just turns into a very positive uh, product for the task force. And we also have a field book uh, based off this document that we provide to our, our trainees uh, when we're given the training as well. Um, there's also a lot of, I mean, there is a lot of positive work coming out of our TIM task force, and we're really lucky to have such a proactive group that takes to heart what we do. Um, so our TIM program is driven by six met matrix. Uh, and I'll break down each of these in a little bit more detail coming up here, uh, as you can see. So um, I apologize. Some of these, these bullet points on this were, were kind of screwed up in the upload from uh, PowerPoint to, to Adobe. So uh, I'm not really sure what the little leaves are on the side, but they used to be bullet points. Uh, but anyways, we'll, we'll work through it. So um, oh, advance that a little quick there. So measuring success. Uh, you know, we're, we're not making this program about the numbers specifically trained rather than who needs to be trained, right? Uh, so we're targeting a lot of this training in the areas that have a high no higher number of crashes, okay, some areas that might need help, um, you know, I mean, how we can improve response in these, in some of these areas. So currently, Massachusetts, uh, we don't really have a reliable uh, ability to consistently track roadway clearance times because our systems that we currently have don't lend themselves to capturing this information. But that's something that we are currently working on. We're, we're work moving forward with a lot of this stuff to, to really uh, increase that accuracy and reliability of this data that we have coming in so we can tell how well our TIM training is doing. Uh, I know the latest INREC study kind of focuses on Metro Boston and identifies some, some engineering issues with uh, some roadways. Uh, and some of our higher crasher areas, sorry, excuse me, higher crash areas generally include roadways uh, that have engineering challenges to them. So uh, again, that's what we're really working on through this program. You know, some of our design and construction groups have uh, really started pre-staging towing and recovery professionals in some of these areas where we, we, are have, we do have ongoing construction to, do, to address some of these issues, uh, just so we can, we can clear these incidents that much quicker. All right. And uh, we do have a lot of referrals from, from local departments. We'll have some group that will come in. We'll train them. They'll have a connection in another department. Hey, this is really good training. We, we should do it. So, you know, that's, that's really a measure of success for us by all these just word of mouth trainings that we've, we've done. So <clears throat> the inclusion in the uh, Department of Labor Standards, okay, that's, uh, that was come as a recommendation for fire and uh, become more involved um, when this was a recommendation. It was also adopted into the MPTC, or the Municipal Police Training Committee in Massachusetts. And I'll discuss that a little bit further when we get into the institu institutionalization. Um, this is also a requirement for all towing contracts, all these contra all towing recovery professionals that are working on our state roadways. Um, that was just in a, uh, it's in a recently uh, released uh, contract with our, our Massachusetts State Police.
So measuring success, our participant course evaluations, our comments that we get from that, um, that's really been a, uh, a really good uh, resource for us when we're moving forward developing our training. Uh, we really take into account a lot of these, the input from our, our students. Uh, if there's things that, you know, they may have seen in their specific line of work, we have them make a comment on our feedback forms, you know, and we'll take that to heart. We'll, we'll develop that into our training uh, if it's something that we need to. Um, and again, a lot of these positive um, comments, as you can see up here on the, uh, the slide, uh, has been a result. So our multidisciplinary approach to this training. All right, we take the multidisciplinary approach in all aspects of our program, you know, from our task force, obviously, from our implementation committee for the training, our trainers, and the audience. All right, so we're, we coordinate with our communities that are hosting and trying to include all the, all the different response disciplines in that area um, in the training audience. You know, so it's a lot easier, as we know, to, you know, have a conversation with your fellow responders out there in a controlled environment, whether it be the training, a controlled exercise than it is on the side of the road with these cars coming by at a really high rate of speed. Um, so sometimes uh, this is uh, difficult to do when it's an academy training or a targeted uh, agency training. You don't really have that multidisciplinary input in the audience. So that's when we really try to overcome this by having that multidisciplinary instructor group. Um, and uh, this is something that's really worked out well for us. Again, we have the, the TIM task force. Uh, and a lot of these different members on our implementation committee. Uh, so there's a lot of support from these different agencies, and they're very, very supportive of having their instructors, you know, take time out to come and support, uh, just to provide that multidisciplinary perspective in our training. So our program coordination, we take the time to identify the needs and response and uh, capabilities of our local communities, agencies, and departments. And we have adjusted training to better suit their needs. All right, some uh, reserve intermittent academies train only at nights and weekends. Some of our volunteer departments are the same way. And uh, oftentimes, tone and recovery professionals are the same. It's better to, to serve them with night and weekend training, uh, just a little bit easier than trying to capture them in a 9 to 5 or 7 to 3 atmosphere. Um, so we make adjustments, uh, and we, we do training at night, weekends, um, you know, wherever we can. Massachusetts is made up of 351 uh, cities and towns. We have 360 municipal-based fire departments. 206 of those are volunteer-based. 100 of those are career-based. We also have 54 career-based that are supported by volunteers. So uh, significant seg uh, segments of our major roadways are covered by volunteer departments. So we really try to get out there and, and, and reach a lot of these groups that might not be able to make it because of their day jobs. So a lot of the, the current topics that we're training towards, you know, we're always keeping an eye out on some of the emerging technology that's available. Right now, hydrogen fuel cell obviously being a big thing uh, coming our way. I know it's big out in California, but we've adjusted our training to include that in the special circumstance uh, section, you know, lesson eight. Um, Ground-mounted solar, right? A lot of these solar panels that are out there, they, they you know, they present their own challenges uh, when dealing with incident response. So, you know, we, we focus a lot on that as well. Um, and a lot of our highways and local roadways are interrelated, and some of the cascading order of effects associated with each, we really try to drive that home. You know, sometimes you might have a local um, group that might not be so, you know, inclined to really see the, the benefit of this going on on the highways. But when we explain how this can back up into their local communities, how we really want to promote quick clearance, and shrinking that timeline we're out there responding down and how that can be benefit them as well. You know, I think they're all, they're all really on board with this stuff and vice versa. So a lot of our drills and exercises that we're doing, a lot of our course material, all right, some of our presentations, we're really molding this to basically better capture our target audience. All right, we've included a lot of local and uh, secondary roadways in a lot of the training. A lot of the presentations, um, we'll get into a number of the exercises that we're doing in a moment here. But uh, we have a high demand from departments who don't really have highway segments in their jurisdiction. So again, you know, we're really developing a lot of this training, uh, targeting them as well. All right. Some of the course material that's provided, we have uh, you know, a copy of our URM field guide, which I spoke about earlier. We also have a temporary traffic control zone card that we hand out, which you can see on the lower left there. 
Uh, and that just, again, lays out very basic roles and responsibilities out there, just distance uh, for the cones, our signage, how we want to have our vehicles positioned out there. Um, and again, you know, we make the caveat that this is going to make a lot more sense to you once you've gone through this training, uh, and it does. Um, and it's again, another great, great product out of the Tim Task Force. So integration to other programs. Our TIM program has been integrated into numerous programs and initiatives across the state. Um, you can see, uh, especially with the Department of Labor Standards, as I talked about earlier, uh, as, as uh, a government ruling for employee training. Mass General Law 149, Section 6, was signed into law on March, uh, I'm sorry, in March of 2014, and that extended occupational health and safety, uh, I'm sorry, OSHA, protections to all public employees. So, Mass require, uh, sorry, requires Mass Department of Labor and Standards to develop regulations, standards for public sector employees and employers. So DLS developed a minimum training recommendation for all, all these different public sector partners out there. And our TIM training was included in their minimum training requirements for police, fire, and public works. Uh, again, another big draw. They sit on the task force with us. They have input. You know, a lot of these agencies that, that you know, are so actively involved in the TIM program, really makes it much easier to get this stuff integrated when they, again, they have a voice in the task force and the training. So TIM is included as a, uh, sorry, in the uh, Massachusetts um, State Police towing contracts, as I spoke about earlier. Uh, it's also institutionalized as part of the, the curriculum of, for the Massachusetts Municipal Police Academies, which I'll talk to uh, coming, up in, coming up next. And uh, in 2015, uh, the Massachusetts TIM program was authorized to award uh, four continuing credit, um, uh, sorry, continuing education credits with the Office of Emergency Medical Services, again, falling under the Department of Public Health. Um, they sit on the task force as well. They really saw a lot of the benefits. They were able to uh, have input on the training. And when they really have that active interest, that again, that really helps us uh, moving this forward. So combining the work zone safety and the TIM training for law enforcement academies, this is what we had to do to really institutionalize this into the TIM training for the municipal academies in Massachusetts. It's kind of a funny story. Uh, back in late 2016, one of our law enforcement instructors was attending an MPTC, or Municipal Police Training Committee meeting, uh, on an unrelated curriculum item. And uh, it's when he noticed that the, the TIM training or the traffic training for the law enforcement uh, in the curriculum was was similar, but just not the same as far as what we were teaching to all these other disciplines out there. So we had a discussion with the committee, came back, uh, we ended up showing up doing a, a presentation to the group, and um, finding out in order to meet the accreditation needs, we ended up combining the, the TIM training with our safety department's uh, two-hour work zone safety training. And as soon as we did that, they were all on board, we ended up basically handling a lot of the training for the TIM training moving forward uh, in all these academies. So it was adopted in early 2017 and, and the rest is history. That's been a, a huge gain for us. You know, we, we basically got most of our groups playing from the same sheet of music under, out there. And, uh, you know, everybody, um, you know, at least have an understanding of each other's roles and responsibilities uh, while we're out there on the, on the side of the road working. Uh, it wasn't so much just that law enforcement uh, aspect of, you know, law enforcement training law enforcement. You know, now we had police, fire, you know, EMS, DPW, they had their input into the training uh, when it comes to traffic incident management as well. Um, that was a very big success for us uh, in the Commonwealth. So our program um, growth, you can see obviously participant evaluation and feedback like I talked to before, we really take into account what these uh, recruits and a lot of these uh, these people in our training audience are saying about the training in our feedback forms. Um, our coordination with our work zone safety training, right? Uh, refresher training. Um, we really want to um, move forward uh, developing training that includes, you know, supervisor or uh, uh, refresher training for some of these groups that have gone through the training years ago. Uh, that's something we're working towards. Uh, you know, super, supervisor programs as well. I know State Police, uh, Massachusetts State Police does a, an abbreviated program, which obviously we don't count towards our TIM training, but it's, it's basically a summarized version just to keep a lot of these patrol supervisors updated on a lot of the things that have changed uh, in the world of TIM. All right. 
So a lot of our uh, full-scale exercises that have done, been done out there, we've done a number of these uh, from tractor-trailer tanker rollovers and uh, track, uh, military armored personnel carriers. We did one of these. Uh, we had one roll off of a, a low boy trailer onto a vehicle, and it really spurred a lot of different con conversations because we do have a number of military bases, like you know, many, many, uh, every state out there, basically. And uh, you know, what do you do when there's sensitive items invo involved? How do we include the TIM training into the groups that would respond to convoy incidents out there on the roadway with our National Guard or military partners as well? Uh, we ended up developing a uh, new notification procedure based on this this exercise here. Um, hazmat related spills or incidents and uh, we've done a number of uh, extraction and uh, injury scenarios with local state and private partners a lot of these groups now they'll they'll have their own training requirements that you can fit into this training you know just to make it that much more attractive um, I know we've usually done a, a like a quick Tim training workshop prior to doing these exercises you know we'll hold a four-hour training and then we'll we'll go out there and do a practical exercise out there on on a, in a parking lot or in a section of closed roadway that we've gone out and put temporary striping on to make it simulate you know like one of our bridges or you know a really uh, an area that needs a little bit of special attention when, when it comes to train so overcoming some of these obstacles that are out there I know similar to, to Kevin's presentation previously that you saw um, you know we've all been expect, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we've all been, um, you know, kind of affected by the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's pre presented some challenges, you know, for all of us when it comes to getting the training out. And in the Com Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we still had academies that were in session, and we still had TIM training requirements for some of our partner groups, um, while still observing these social media distance requirements that were set forth by our governor. So initially, in order to, prov to provide a stopgap, in training. We directed a lot of these groups to the Sharp 2 online training um, in which you just heard Paul and uh, Jim talking about, you know, you'd rather have the TIM training in person where you can. And obviously not being, you know, 100% feasible at this point in time. Um, when it came to a lot of these academies um, and due to the work zone safety requirement, we ended up going to a re remote webinar based training um, where we could still provide our multidisciplinary group of instructors, all right, we, you know, everybody kind of given that different perspective, um, just as we normally would with our in-person training. And, uh, you know, I definitely want to give a big thanks out to our consultant support for this, uh, Ranger Security and Emergency Preparedness, did a lot of the legwork of working with these different academies and groups and handling the technological side of this. But we were all right able to basically roll into training like we normally would, you know, be it in our offices uh, or... Uh, you know, some of these trainers at home rolling through this training just like we would through a no normal four-hour training. And um, this is how we conducted the training to the uh, Massachusetts State Police uh, 85th RTT. We conducted 240 uh, recruits in just one shot. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it worked out great. Uh, everybody was kind of moving towards this training anyways, trying to get a good, good foundation and uh, you know, we proved to our, our internal group that, hey, this works. You know, this is a way we can do it moving forward through this, this pandemic. So the future, uh, looking towards our future in Massachusetts, we really think we have a lot to, to gain from doing more of these full-scale exercises, uh, getting people out there, shaking hands, you know, uh, exchanging business cards, uh, really opening their eyes to some of these uh, capabilities of these other groups. Uh, that are out there. You know, we'll stop an exercise and we'll, uh, we'll uh, basically pick up, you know, hey, this is something that we can do differently. This is a capability that a different group has. You know, MassDOT can get out there with sign boards and put variable messaging up to let people know, uh, you know, speaking from our perspective anyways. Uh, but really getting that multidisciplinary perspective out there, really doing this stuff in a hands-on environment has proven, uh, you know, just a great improvement, all right? Uh, one of the other things we're trying to do is institutionalize this training in the fire service, all right, making this more so of a requirement and say, firefighter one for us. Um, and that's something that our, our Division of Fire Services have uh, really uh, jumped on and, and supported. So that's what we're moving towards. Um, and again, we're really excited to hear more about this interactive training uh, that's available out there. I know we were talking about doing it a while in the past, um, you know, 
basically including it into our in-person presentation, just a, an interactive kind of around the room type of training that we were going to do. You know, positioning vehicles, uh, you know, what uh, notifications would go out, you know, what groups would be responding to what incidents. All right. So I think that about wraps it up for me. Um, if anybody has any kind of questions, uh, any, any comments, uh, you have my information up there. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to me or, or send me an email. Um, but I guess I'll, uh, I'll turn this presentation back over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. You've done a fantastic job, and you had certainly had a lot more success um, engaging all these other agencies that I, I actually tried and failed. So where I failed, you didn't. So that uh, kudos to you, and uh, I think it's a, do a lot of hard work that you've been doing. I, I wouldn't say that you failed. I think you kind of uh, laid a lot of the groundwork. <laughs> and all right, we, we I'll picked take, it up. I'll take full credit for all the success. <laughs> <laughs> no, but again, uh, I, I just, I just really want to stress that, you know, having these groups so actively involved in the training and on the task force has really opened the door a lot to, you know, a lot of these different initiatives that we try to accomplish here. Well, well put, Ed. Well put. Thank you very much. A few of you asked a question, Tim. Um, Ed was talking a lot about the Tim training. When he was referring to the Tim training, yes, it was the SHOP2 National Responder Training. Uh, there was a few questions in there. You couldn't read them while you were presenting, Ed, but that's, I, that's what you were in, in large part talking about, except when he was talking about the hands-on uh, uh, um, other, other training. But mostly with Tim training was the National Responder Training Program. Up next is uh, Chris King, who has been a strong partner of, of Federal Highway for a long time, almost as, yeah, as long as I go back with Federal Highway, 11 years now, believe it or not. And um, Chris has been there the whole time. He wasn't always in the position he's in now, but he's the, the boss now, or the boss of his section now. <laughs> wasn't when I first met him, but, uh, but just been a phenomenal, phenomenal um, champion for Tim uh, throughout the Philadelphia region. And um, with that, I'll stop introducing you, Chris, and let you take it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate the kind words. Um, yeah, we've been involved in traffic incident management um, really for over 20 years. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of give a, a brief overview of our, our uh, TIM program and kind of how we have kind of switched what we typically do, you know, to, you know, deal with uh, continuing, continuing to promote traffic incident management in our region um, during uh, this time of social distancing in the COVID period. So uh, who is the DVRPC? We always get that question. Um, we're the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, but we're really a, the federally designated MPO uh, for the Philadelphia region, both um, in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. So we do planning in both both states, um, dealing with both uh, DOTs um, and state police, who are really our strong partners. Um, you know, in our at our office really deals with transportation, land use, open space, housing, economic development, and a lot of the uh, the, the, the transportation funding um, kind of goes through our office. Uh, you know, for projects that are happening in our Philadelphia region. So, you know, well over 20 years ago, you know, our office had definitely made a commitment to uh, transportation operations and ITS, and, and this traffic incident management was one of the things that kind of arose as we move forward. Um, you know, our, our Philadelphia is really right, you know, in the center of the, oops, wrong way, I-95 quarter coalition, or the quarter, you know, between New York City, Baltimore, Washington, so you can kind of see our region. Um, we do have oh, about six million people, with uh, you know 112 you know million vehicle miles traveled a day. So there's a lot of traffic, a lot of transit trips, um, and, and we do have you know 351 municipalities in our region. So a lot of our you know and, and it's a commonwealth in Pennsylvania. So a lot of the ownership of the roads, a lot of the the highway um, you know police fire do take take control in those areas. So it's a really what we do is facilitate our traffic incident management program and try to bring as many players as we can to the table. Um, you know, when we started, we, we definitely try to promote our, our program, you know, the, the national unified goal of responder safety, uh, quick clearance, and, and, you know, interoperable communication, but more or less, more so just communication back and forth. That's like a strong point in, in having everybody deal with each other on a, in a, on a regular basis. Um, so. We're trying to integrate our, our incident management into our metropolitan planning process, you know, into our long-range goals, long-range plans. Um, 
the training is obviously a big thing that's been talked about today, and it's something that we, we promote um, not only at our meetings, but you know, we're working with our partners in both Pennsylvania and New Jersey who have strong uh, traffic uh, incident management programs um, on a statewide basis. So uh, our main focus is you know, internally for our office is really uh, managing our incident management task forces. I mean, kind of serving as that liaison between the locals and the state county agencies. And we've been able to, over the years, kind of procure some software applications and things that we've done to help help our responders, hopefully, um, you know, respond quickly and safer to the incident. So, as I mentioned, you know, we started 20 years ago um, with one task force in our Montgomery County area, uh, what we call the I-76, 476 uh, corridor. Um, PennDOT had asked us uh, to try to get together a group of responders and talk about traffic incident management and how they respond and how they coordinate. Um, you know, it happened to be probably about a year or so, you know, after the uh, the Lionville incident that everybody's heard about where, where one of the firefighters, Dave Good, was, was struck and killed on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. So I, I think incident management, you know, was beginning to come to the forefront and um, PennDOT took a proactive approach at trying to see, you know, how we could develop uh, some communication between each of the uh, responders that are out there that were typically, you know, responding themselves, maybe not coordinating as much. So we were able to put together one task force, um, and then it kind of evolved over time to where we now facilitate eight different traffic incident management task forces. So uh, my office, I, I have a strong team, a uh, strong staff of uh, you know, Paul Carafides and Justin Neff and Katie Nash, who help manage uh, many of these uh, task forces. Um, and get diff different responders together, work with our locals to provide these quarter-based TIM teams. Uh, we don't have a regional, you know, approach. Ours is more quarter-based where we get out there, you know, and have our meetings in each of these counties on a regular basis. Um, as I said, we, we do try to have quarterly meetings in, in these different uh, task force areas. Um, and, and each of these task forces, they probably, in the beginning, typically started out, you know, like I said, quarter-based, you know, mainly focusing on the limited access highways because that was the easier thing. But, you know, as, as time has evolved and progressed, you know, we've obviously realized that these traffic incident management approaches, you know, can happen on every roadway and, and keeping safe regardless if you're on a, a high-speed high road or a local road um, or in the, the rural sections of our, of, our, of our region is also important. And providing the proper safety and training and, and communication with that is, is critical. So we've really expanded our regions now to maybe not just focusing on the main roadways, but, you know, to a county-based region. So um, it's been, they've been pretty successful, and, and I think due in large part because we do select chairpersons that help us out with each meetings. You know, they're local, you know, responders from each of the areas that provide us uh, with the, the credibility, I think, for, for many of these task forces to begin, because as, as, as I mentioned, we're a planning organization. We don't have any operational um, aspects. You know, we're not out there responding, but we do bring a, a strong uh, a strong capability to facilitate these meetings, bring the proper people together, and provide an overall approach that you know has been able to be sustained over a long period of time. Um, you know, we're, we're there all the time, and, and we've been able to be a, a force, I think, to bring these, these people together um, on, a, on, a, on a consistent basis. So as part, of, as part of our typical activities, we tend to rotate our meetings around um, so that you can provide access to different parts of the counties. Um, we also do incident action reviews, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but that's a real strong component of our task forces um, because it does get people talking a little bit more during the meetings, and, and it does provide us with the capability to um, learn from each other's incidents and, uh, for the next time. Uh, we, we do collect some incident data um, with some of our systems um, from PennDOT New Jersey DOT data that, that I'll talk about a little bit later as well. So we do try to provide that data. Um, mostly it's roadway closure and duration time, but incident locations. So um, we do try to present that to our task forces. Um, based on the task force, we do a lot of construction updates. There's a lot of projects that are happening in you know, in each of the regions. So we do try to, to we, we are able to bring some of those resident engineers to talk about the specific projects that are happening on the highways and let them know when there might be shift changes, you know, in, in, in the lanes closing, opening ramps closing. So we give them, you know, try to give them the heads up, and the responders and the heads up 
as much as possible so that if need be, you know, response changes can happen, you know, and be prepared for sooner than later. We've been able to develop some uh, traffic incident management operating guidelines in many of our task forces um, so that a lot of these uh, procedures and policies that, you know, we, we teach in the TIM training is, is on paper so everybody is aware of them. You know, there are some specialized things for, you know, regarding communication or location that are, that are depending on task forces that are also included. Um, like I said, we do, do, do um, promote SHARP-2 training whether it's, you know, the, the regular sharp tooth training that, that the Federal Highway is teaches or, you know, in our region, both Pennsylvania and New Jersey have adapted the sharp tooth training and localized it to, to a statewide training. So they do use a lot of local um, examples and they've kind of highlighted it and focused it more towards, towards the individual states, but it's all been, you know, approved by uh, sharp tooth. So we, we work closely with both, uh, both of those um, states with Todd Lice from Pennsylvania, uh, Mike Moran, Liz Falcone from New Jersey DOT and, and their TIM program. So it's been a real valuable relationship, having that strong relationship with them. And then our meetings, you know, we do a lot of different specialized topics or cross-training, you know, maybe a vehicle demonstration from a particular agency, you know, bringing in the fatal investigation unit to talk about what their needs and responsibilities are and, and how to address, you know, incident scenes during some of these types of things. So our meetings change, you know, the topics change all the time. We're always looking for topics, but it, but it is a, a great place to share information, um, you know, at the, the various meetings. And, you know, the success is, is definitely, you know, the building of the relationships, you know, getting people to know each other before this, the scene of the incident, and you know, everyone's well aware of how valuable that is. Uh, like I said, we conduct the after-action reviews, you know, we facilitate the training. You know, our, our office, we've been able to provide some regional traffic incident management conferences, um, you know, three of them, and we've been able to hold them at uh, Citizen Bank Ballpark where the Philadelphia Phillies play. So we've gotten a great response from our areas. You know, we usually get around 250 different responders that all come to these individual meetings. Uh, they have a, a roadway network that we can shut down and provide some additional specialized training in. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, Paul mentioned, our, our first one we had in 2011, we actually had Gary Millsaps from Georgia come up and, and do a really great training facility on how to vehicle scene placement. So we've been able to bring different people in. Um, and both Paul and Jim, I think, pre presented at, at those conferences. So we're we're looking to continue those in the future. So I'll, I'll be, a, you know, we're not quite sure where our conference in 2021 will be or how it'll how it'll look. So, um, you know, we're the central data clearinghouse for you know incident management in the Philadelphia region. So we do the TIM self assessments. You know, we've done some special projects regarding you know that have come up at different meetings and and that type of thing early on. We did some ramp designation signage. Um, projects where we had some complicated ramps and, and they did some kind of type of mile marker signage for each of those ramps so that people would know where they were if they got broken down along those way. We also like you know, with the construction coordination, um, we, we've been able to kind of bring uh, consultants together. Uh, PennDOT has had a couple projects where they're calling their integrated quarter management um, projects. So along I-76 in our region um, and in our Interstate I-476, which are some, you know, congested roadways. They're looking at, at ways to increase the, the flow of traffic and reduce the congestion. So on both of those roadways, they're looking at um, implementing some part-time shoulder use during uh, peak hours of traffic congestion um, and opening the shoulders to lanes of traffic. So that's big, been a, a big, you know, matter of contention between responders and, and what PennDOT wants to do. So we've been able to bring our responders to these planning meetings um, early, early in the process of these projects to get the needs and the feedback from responders um, to see what they need on the roadways and, 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 and try to make any accommodations we can to make the, the, these plans and, you know, a little bit more um, applicable to, uh, to emergency responders. So we're working through those as those projects continue to move. And then our office has been able to deal with the different special event planning that, that has come through our region. We're able to work with our larger agencies and kind of sometimes bring the information down to the lower level to, to uh, other task forces that, that, are, that are happening. So um, like I said, we do, do some software packages that we've evolved over the year over the years, and one of our main programs is we have a, what we call our, our RIMAS program, which is a re regional integrated multimodal sharing program. It's a, a web-based information sharing network, and we've really partnered with um, 
you know, Transcom, which is in North Jersey, who works with New Jersey, DOT, Connecticut, New York, um, and we've been able to bring a system that they have implemented up there down to our region and bring it to our users. We've been able to tie into PennDOT's data, um, the, the Turnpike information, you know, and the system really connects uh, traffic management centers um, with some 911 call centers and a lot of the local emergency responders in our area. Um, it does provide a warehouse of historical incident data, travel times. Um, it has, you know, historical travel times, so we can do some planning studies. We can our, our other planners, our other congestion management management process teams can can use the information um, in their planning efforts. You know, but one of the, the key things that the program does is it it actually offers us the ability to make these video walls um, based off of wherever the uh, response areas are for our local responders to bring the, the PennDOT and New Jersey DOT cameras um, and focus them, um, you know, for individual response agencies. And so they have it up in their stations. You know, they can bring it up now, you know, on any laptop or, or uh, um, tablet that they need to look at the cameras out there, you know, if they need to before they respond to the incident. So um, it's been a valuable way to provide situational awareness to a lot of our local responders before they get to the scene of the incident, um, beyond just the, the calls from their 911s. Yeah, another aspect, like I mentioned, is there is a great historical event search. So we can kind of identify where the incidents are, the locations, and, and a lot of the durations or road closure dur durations of some of these incidents um, in our region. And we try to bring them back to our task forces to discuss them um, specifically. We also can monitor you know, really long-term incidents, kind of finding some of those incidents that, that did take a long time and maybe use those as as a um, an after action at our next meeting and, and see what happens. So, it, you know, look, it shows where there are time of day. There's a lot of different tools and different outputs that we use um, that we're trying to continue to monitor, you know, traffic incident management and the incidents that do occur um, in the Philadelphia region. And and the programs are always evolving. You know, they're, they're working and, and the, the operators are now trying to be more cognizant of, of when the roadway closes and keeping better traffic into the management data. So um, we're moving forward with that to continue to um, keep that process going. Yeah, those, those are just a few of the things I could talk for hours on, on what our program does and a lot of the different, you know, things we've done over the years. But what I wanted to mention was um, <clears throat> how we've been able to facilitate these meetings during, during the pandemic and, and keep them going. Um, it's difficult to, you know, obviously hold our in-person meetings at this time, <clears throat> but we wanted to make sure that we did pr keep continuing to promote that traffic incident management is important, even though responders were dealing with all these COVID different issues and, 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 and those things. But, you know, as traffic, you know, diminished in our region, unfortunately, we, we had a kind of aspect of, you know, there were a lot of struck buys or a few struck buys in a, in a relatively short amount of time. You know, speeds were increasing on the roadway, although traffic was decreasing. So we had some, you know, you know, fire police responders that were struck in one of our on one of our roadways. Uh, we had a, a fire department in, in Chester County, Thorndale Fire Company, that was struck at the scene of an incident, and then uh, a Pennsylvania State Trooper was struck um, at another scene in Pennsylvania. And you know, obviously, everybody knows these are continuing to happen on an ongoing basis. We just had another New Jersey State Trooper that was struck by a, a, a dump truck um, on the New Jersey Turnpike a, a few days ago. And, and magnificently, he's, he survived a horrific incident. So um, we wanted to make sure that, you know, although the pandemic is, is happening, traffic incident management in, in, is still important to keep going. So, so what we did, instead of holding, you know, eight different meetings in all of our quarters, we decided to bring everybody together um, for, for one meeting at a time um, and, and using a Zoom format uh, we were able to provide a, 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 an atmosphere where we could bring everybody together, um, and we tried to you know, be cognizant of their time frame. And, and, and during this difficult, you know, period, and we we kept it to about an hour long duration. So we we only had speakers, you know, and hosts had microphone and video capability, but we did use you know polls. We tried to keep it interactive with chat boxes and, and you know the question and answer boxes as much as we could to to still try to provide that interaction. So. We've been able to hold four of these meetings, you know, where all the ad task forces are together. And we've had really great participation you know, from, you know, 110 to 175 persons per call. Um, and we've kind of tried to keep them consistently, you know, on a Wednesday morning um, biweekly just to be, to be consistent. So it's been a great, great um, avenue to, to bring the people together. We've had a lot of great speakers, um, and it definitely – 
you know, we may not have been able to get up all the questions answered, but it was, it was a good. But what we really thought, you know, moving forward, even though traffic incident management is important, there was an importance of sharing some of the uh, the information during this pandemic of, you know, maybe the initial agency report updates, how they were patrolling, were the tolls open, you know, where, where uh, the safety service patrol is active during this time. So we had all the different agencies kind of give a little update in the beginning on, on what their responses and how they've changed. We had a lot. We did a lot of outreach to a lot of our key uh, stakeholders um, to see what kind of standard operating procedures they had that that might have changed, you know, responding to incidents and what they were doing. Um, so we had all the different disciplines kind of uh, talk about what their, their their changes were, whether it was you know only essential people at the stations or you know not allowing adults ride in ambulances or or whether customers for towing agency were allowed to ride it in their vehicles, you know, they're trying to get other rides for them if possible. There's a whole gamut of things. I don't want to go through all of them. I'm sure there were very similar things done around the whole country, but it was we thought it was really important to bring these changes, especially, you know, in the first meeting or two of what was going on. It was a real fluid situation and things were changing and it was a great way to share information back and forth so that others could see what other other people from different counties or different regions were doing. Um, and, you know, maybe make, make changes. So we thought that was really valuable. And then as we kind of a, approached, you know, our fourth meeting, we, we, we decided to have a couple other key agencies kind of give a, an overview of really what happened specifically during how they responded and provided a little bit more detail on what they did and how they provided PPE and how they were moving forward and planning their efforts, you know, as this uh, uh, pandemic continues to progress. So um, it was a real valuable um, resource sharing information, um, and, and I thought we got a lot of positive feedback from our local responders. Uh, another a great thing uh, was with this virtual meeting environment, we were able to bring in a, a, a lot of a few keynote speakers from outside of our region. You know, from Florida, we brought in uh, Chief Mark Bashur talking about maintaining mental strength and focus during times. Uh, Jack Sullivan, um, you know, from Emergency Responder Institute, talking about you know, the past, present, and future of responder safety and what maybe we can do in the future, you know, moving forward to continue, you know, collecting better data, collect better funder and improving responder safety. And then we had, you know, a, a local chief, but, you know, from you know, recently from outside the area, well-respected, talked about commanding traffic responses and promoting, you know, unified incident command at, at many of the incidents and large-scale incidents in our region. So it was a great way to be able to provide, you know, an outside resource that typically is not going to be able to, to come to individual quarter meetings, but to bring them into our region, you know, one time for everybody to hear has been really valuable. And we, we see this moving forward as something we might be able to do locally as well, um, even when we get back to uh, regional meetings. Uh, after action and reviews, they were also, uh, we thought, were an important aspect of continuing the traffic incident management program and, and getting the word out. So we did have Every meeting had a, uh, you know, the last three meetings actually had, had a, a nice uh, incident review from a local responder, whether it was a struck by that happened um, last October on our Pennsylvania Turnpike where a, a firefighter's team was struck at a, you know, a, a, just a disabled vehicle out on the roadway. Um, you know, on, a, on a nice sunny day, they were struck by someone who passed, passed asleep or, you know, a multi-vehicle incident or a, a, an interesting one where we had a tanker rolled over spill on, on, on you know, one of our, our state highways, however, it was near a, near a bridge and a lot of the flow kind of went down the embankment to a local road. So there was a lot of different resources, a lot of different coordination between different agencies. So it's still really good. And, and like I said, these after action reviews are, are really valuable in our local TIM meetings to kind of get the information flowing between each other, um, finding new partners maybe that we haven't invited to meetings before now come, come to our meetings or you know, new topics for our future meetings. So it's been a, a real valuable experience to kind of promote these after action reviews. And, and they're real informal, you know, non-critical. We don't have a, a, a real report on them, but it's just, you know, an informal way to, to provide information back and forth to learn from others' experiences. Another value aspect, and I'll go through this quickly, is we did try to really promote the online TIM training resource. As I mentioned, we have a really great relationship with NJ TIM and Penn Time of our, in, our, in our area. And we promote their their statewide uh, traffic incident management training. Uh, Pentan has actually been able to um, you know do a lot of in-person training, but they've also been able to coordinate and, and put put together the four-hour class online. So that's capability, and they have it in a couple locations 
both for trained PA, which is for you know the firefighters use and law enforcement use of the other PA training network. So it's out there, and I think there was an uptick in uh, online training during this time. So we definitely promoted online training. There's some other resources that we like to like to promote responder safety. There's a fire hero learning network, and and there was a lot of webinars by a local Pennsylvania Fire and Emergency Services Agency um, that people could do while they were at home if they weren't you know working, and it allowed this time where their social distancing did allow for extra aspects of you know online training. So we made sure that we promoted that at, that at every meeting um, to make sure that that was being done. Moving forward, I think you know obviously we're going to continue to promote Tim and responder safety. Um, we've kind of transitioned our biweekly meetings um, to monthly for July and August. Uh, it, it is cumbersome to kind of keep continually to promote things every week, every other week. So you get done with the meeting and then you're starting to plan for the next one. So it was a real effort and I can't thank my staff enough for all the help that they put together. So um, we do anticipate maybe trying to do these quarter-based, you know, virtual meetings in the fall, getting back to the localized quarters. Um, just, you know, if there's things to share locally, you know, especially with regards to construction projects and that. I'm not sure when we'll be able to go in person again, but we do tend, to, we do think we'll continue these virtual meetings, and we'll probably supplement them with, you know, regional virtual team meetings too as needed, you know, bringing in a national um, subject matter experts and or having one maybe in late fall to, pro to promote the, the National Traffic Incident Response Awareness to all of our task forces. Uh, we typically do a social media campaign um, and provide some information, so it's a good way maybe to get it all out there at once. So, you know, we'll evaluate our conference and then you know, we understand that this is a fluid situation and who knows moving forward how things will go. So we're trying to provide, um, you know, work best with our emergency responders to accommodate their needs, you know, as best we can. So it's been a great, valuable experience. Um, and I think, you know, we've learned some things in the virtual environment that we may continue to do. We may have local webinars with, with subject matter experts from outside of our region. Um, it does provide a great resource to, you know, provide extra things that we may not have done in the future. So, you know, we, we're continuing to provide a, a, provide for our, our responders. And I, I do appreciate the time um, today that you've allowed us to talk. And if there's any questions or whatnot, you know, that's some of my information. We're always, uh, you know, willing to participate or help out as much as we can. So thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. No, thank you, Chris. And uh, thanks for all that you do. You, you know, you, you carry a big load up there in the metro Philly area. and. Uh, and two very strong programs there that you, you are a very strong participant with in New Jersey and Philadelphia. So we really appreciate appreciate your help. So uh, we're going to move on to um, Jim. Are you are you back up and running, Mr. Ostrich? Yep. All right, then you got it. Okay, Paul. Well, thank you. Uh, while my uh, PowerPoint is loading here. Um, just want to echo or I guess refresh uh, some of the terms I heard or uh, said earlier by uh, Ed uh, Ginkakis from MassDOT and, and others. The, the term institutionalization of the TIM training is music to our ears at Federal Highway. and. Uh, if you are, and, and, and I got to say, we've had over 140 uh, participants on today's call again. Uh, that's fantastic. And please uh, share, share the URL, share the, uh, the Talking Tim uh, URL with, with colleagues, because we want to see a lot more on, the, on these webinars. But anyway, if, if you're... Uh, influencer, uh, a leader in your state, which from by and large from all the names that I've scanned through here today, um, the the champions that you all are, that you have the, the ability to influence um, your team, your TIM committees, and folks to continue the charge on the TIM training. Uh, that is so important. And you guys, uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure who, who said it, maybe it was that as well, or or Chris, the, the charge with this training doesn't stop just because of this pandemic. Um, and so my, I only have a few slides. I cut the slides down purposely, uh, but this is a great way uh, to, to end the, the webinar today. 
we're we're almost at as you can see 4 480,000 trained we had a small jump about 1165 trained uh over since the last report 2 weeks ago uh roughly um Two thirds of that was uh, web-based online, which is what we've been encouraging encouraging all states to do. Uh, and and all the links, RespondersSafety.com or your individual state, Tim Trainings, as uh, Chris mentioned, Pennsylvania, or at the National Highway Institute, whatever whatever platform you're using, uh, training source, please please continue to. Uh, to do so. Um, I always share the latest statistics for the struck buys, or I'd like to at least, And uh, but this this is off uh, regrettably. I, I, you know, I hate to report that it's actually 23. Yesterday in the afternoon in the Bay Area, the Bay a, a safety service patroller was struck and killed in the Bay Area Safety Service um, Patrol program. Uh, uh, I believe a 60-year-old um, patroller uh, that was assisting a motorist on the side of the road and uh, was struck by another uh, motorist who stayed on the scene and cooperated with with authorities, um, but when I received that information about the struck by late last night from Jack Sullivan, um, you know, I always pause to say a prayer because it's, it's a very serious thing. And anyway, um, why we are doing one of the reasons we're doing what we're doing to train our nation's responder community, right? And so. Um, you know, there are those that would say, you know, these numbers are low numbers. Well, you know, we all know the number. We all know the answer to that, right? Um, it's a it's a family that's impacted uh, forever, and so we move on. You got to keep one eye on traffic. I used to tell my patrollers back when I was in charge in the DC program, and our nation's roadways are so so dangerous, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, not going to change. Uh, and of course, injuries, as we say, are as much as a hundred times that of of um, the fatalities. The URLs that I shared there and others, you you guys should all know those and have them handily or readily available uh, to share with your comrades. This is the, this, the one slide for the national training, um, both the web base below the, the you know, in parentheses. Uh, I've got to, let's see, what was I going to say here? One thing, the, um, going back to, uh, to Kevin Smith from Parsons who presented on the, uh, the virtual training that they just conducted via the WebEx platform. There are a number of states, I think Paul and I shared during the last month's webinar, uh, that there are a number of states that are getting ready to do similar. And we absolutely encourage you to, to do the same. Yes, we're, you know, starting to get back to normal, if you will, I think, even though, you know, we're all hearing about the numbers of the pandemic, you know, numbers going up in, in certain states. But regardless, um, we can't live our lives, you know, sheltering in place forever. I think we're all, we're all in agreement. We're going to be wearing masks every time we're out in public space. We're going to be going through tons of hand sanitizer and doing all the things we need to do, but we got to get our country back, uh, into full operations. And so each and every one of us plays a role in moving forward when we're doing these trainings. I actually, I, Katie had told me that in the, the stats this month, there was actually a, a handful of trainings that occurred in person. But just do the right thing and protect yourself and all your all your partners. Next, this slide here is the total trained um, nationally. 
And um, I think a little while ago, Jeff Roscoff, who was the previous president of the Tartone Recovery Association in America, asked the question about Tim. Is is it uh, is Tim not being trained? You know, taught in 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 a, in, in, a, in a particular state? He was just wondering, and uh, I don't think there is any state that hasn't taught it and is still teaching, you know, to to some extent. But with the current situation with public safety, in particular law enforcement and others. Uh, the training uh, and, and and could continue to wane because now with reform and all these, you know, initiatives to defund police and all this kind of stuff, uh, training, new training that's going to come out is going to impact TIM training. But we must not um, give up our our commitment to traffic incident management because it it matters for sure. Um, the state of Arkansas, well, first of all, the training totals here, you can see, um, interesting to note, I, owe, I, I always pay attention to fire rescue and EMS. If you combine those two, that's over, uh, what, 230,000 in the fire rescue EMS uh, service that have trained in law enforcement. Uh, a little over 126,000, and of course towing 41. So as uh, Joanne Blyton, president of TRAA, and others have said, we've we've still got a lot, a long way to go, my friends. And uh, why I say we've got to keep pushing. The national map, as far as the goals, um, you know, the 45 percent uh, goal. Um, happy to report that the state of Arkansas. Uh, exceeded is, yeah, 55%. So kudos to Arkansas. And we're still at 40 or 21 states that are that are above 45%, which is awesome. Nilo, you want to go ahead and do uh, the, we have some poll questions here real quick. I know we're running out of time, but hopefully everybody will stick with us. Uh, question number one. Real quick, folks, last week was the fire service safety stand down. I'd like to know, we'd like to know if if your state, your agency participated to some extent. Paul and I sent out a national reminder um, to everyone. Um, kudos to IAFC and the National Volunteer Fire Council or Respondersafety.com for, for promoting this during the 2020 stand down and it had to do uh, with responder safety working the, the hazards that exist working out on the roadways. Um, okay, Nilu, um, two and three have to do, um, you can close that one, Nilu, thank you. You can do uh, number two and three, please. I want to make sure we get these in. When do you think in-person training may resume in your state? And the other one, has your TIM committee task slash task force reviewed, revised your training plan for 2020? If you recall in last month's call, we, we talked a little bit about that. So, okay. I see on that number two question, anticipate it will resume in two to three months. 42% and uh, uncertain to make an educated guess. Yeah, almost 30, well, 37%, yeah. And uh, the revised training, again, we, we've asked you to get with your committees and come up with a plan to achieve your goal, your state goal of uh, responders to be trained. And so thank you for that. That's a little shocking on that number three. The, no, this topic has not been discussed, 40% there. So that's a problem. If uh, those of you on this call, again, you have influence and you're a leader, please uh, revisit that with your, with your stakeholders. And the last uh, poll question is, 
Regarding secondary crashes, Paul and I wanted to get this one in there. Is your agency collecting secondary crash data? Okay, so okay. Well, if um, if you are, if you're one of the states responding in the affirmative, um, well, both of those actually, Paul and I would like to talk to you more at some point. Um, because this is an area that we're, we're going to be doing more research in, most likely very soon, along with struck by and along with uh, uh, arterial TIM. You're going to be hearing a lot more about arterial TIM uh, in the practices at, at the local and, you know, on arterial roadways and, and even uh, rural roadways. Okay, thanks for, for the polls, um, um, Nilu. And I'll just close this, uh, my slides out here. Um, real quick, that's self-explanatory. Just a big thank you to all of you. You see the, the logo here. This is the national logo of traffic incident management that was established by the executive leadership group. So never forget, safety, collaboration, and efficiency, that's what we're we're doing here collectively, and without you, we can't we can't be successful. We all have to be in this together, just just like we are during this difficult time during this pandemic. So, with that, Paul, sorry I went over by a couple minutes. I see that's all right. Typing. That's all right. I think everyone went over today. We're not going to have time for questions, but um, I did want to share with you next month's um, agenda. And um, we're going to have our boss talk more about, in general, the national, um, the executive leadership group. We're going to have a great presentation that I've already seen on UAS used for Tim. Uh, many of you are up to speed on that. Um, Sang Lee from Caltrans is going to update us on the California program. The San Francisco Bay Area does, is similar to DVFPC. They do a lot of really cool things with Tim and their community, and, and Sarah Brenworth is going to um, talk about their dashboard. And then Jim and I, hopefully, if the bureaucracy of the federal government allows us, <laughs> we're going to have some very exciting an announcements that Jim um, alluded to, um, alluded to a, a minute ago. Uh, in closing, one more thing. I just want to, John McClellan says we can't train in this time period up there. John is one of my, the country, love John, but this training and the Tim is even more important than ever during this, during these financial hardships that we're going to be coming. So I know John probably doesn't agree with me, but um, that's, that's just my thing. And I'll just close with, Four people were killed in a secondary crash last week in Wisconsin. Um, it was ugly, ugly scene. You know, that's what we do. So we're going to continue to do what we do. It's important. Each and every one of you are doing something that's very, very important to uh, the safety of, of all of our, our communities, and um, we really appreciate it. So with that, hope to see you next month, and hope Jim and I have are able to release some some pretty cool um, information that that um, that we have uh, officially announced, hopefully next month. So, with that, stay safe, everybody. Put your